All right, so we are officially at 531. So I'm gonna go ahead and sort of get us started for the evening. Um, Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us tonight um, as the Lipa Ratner presents um, the first of our artist talks um, that are programming in support of our exhibition of the St. Petersburg College Visual Arts Faculty um, in 2020. And what a year it has been and we're not even through it yet. Um, so thank you for joining us. We're very excited tonight to welcome artists um, and in art instructor, um, Jennifer Guest. Jennifer, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Uh, my name is Teresa Wilkins. I am the director of the museum and I am going to be sort of our moderator for the evening. Um, so as you uh, enjoy our discussion with Jennifer, if you have questions for her, please utilize the chat to send any messages, any questions you might have. And I'll be sort of moderating that, that chat panel um, with Jennifer in her discussion. Um, that'll just make an easy way for us to all have a nice discussion together without trying to manage uh, speaking over one another. Um, in, in that vein, I'm gonna ask everybody to please keep their microphones muted um, as, we're, as we're going through the presentation. That way there'll be plenty of time for Jennifer to do her, her presentation and ample opportunity for everyone to submit their questions in the chat and have those answered as we go through our program. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our curator at the Lipa Ratner Museum of Art, Christine Carter. Uh, Christine, thanks for joining us tonight. Hello. Um, so glad everybody could join us today. Uh, I am Christine Rank Carter, curator of the Lipa Ratner Museum of Art, and I'm actually sitting here in the galleries at the museum in the St. Petersburg College Visual Arts Faculty Exhibition. Uh, we always look forward to this show, which we usually host every two years, and it's always my greatest pleasure to work with the SPC's talented art faculty. Um, I really wanted to take this chance to personally thank all of those faculty members who are participating in this exhibition. And uh, in this show, we wanted to honor them as educators and artists. And then we really admire their creative ingenuity, especially now in these challenging times, as they've had to quickly pivot to teach art in a virtual classroom setting and be a fine artist at the same time. Uh, tonight, I am excited to introduce Jennifer Guest. Uh, she has been an adjunct faculty professor at St. Pete College since 2017. Um, she's based at the Clearwater campus. Of course, right now she's teaching design one and drawing one virtually in a virtual classroom setting, um, which I know can be quite exciting and quite challenging. Um, behind me right here you see is her triptych that's in the faculty show and it's titled Library BC, Single Digit, and Library AD, which is part of her Accurate Description series. And this was done in colored pencil and gouache on paper. Jennifer was born and raised right here in Tarpon Springs. Uh, she received her BFA in 2006 from Sam Houston State University in Huntsville, Texas. And then she earned her MFA in 2014 from Texas Christian University in Fort Worth, Texas. And while she was attending college, Jennifer worked in shopping malls, theme parks, and was a birthday party hostess. And this all influenced her work. And also she draws inspiration from paperback cover illustrations, didactic drawings and dioramas, and Aztec and Mayan codices catalog photographs of consumer goods, which you're going to see in this presentation that are quite hysterical, conceptual texts and postmodern fiction, African sign paintings, and the work of Flemish primitives. All that inspires this, what you see behind me. Uh, she sees her labor intensive process as a personal exorcism ritual that features private anecdotal moments, which are often eccentric and humorous. So without further ado, Please welcome Jennifer Guest. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for coming. <laughs> so the, the triptych that you see on the, oh, let me sh share my screen. <clears throat> there we go. Okay, I should be screen sharing now. <laughs> um, the, the, the triptych that you, that you see on the screen is, um, is how the 
the drawings are installed in the gallery that you can see behind Christine. So it's three separate drawings that are hung closely together. Um, they, they're pretty large in scale and um, especially when you consider the, the, the mode of application and that's um, laboriously <laughs> applied colored pencil just like layer and layer after layer of colored pencil with some finishing touches made with gouache. Um, and I hope that through the format of installation, hanging them uh, really close together, that the works would evoke a narrative um, um, or at least convey the idea that they relate to each other in some way. Um, these drawings are part of a larger body of drawings, which Christine mentioned, um, that I made over the course of a couple of years and which I called Accurate Descriptions. And I can um, try to talk about that title a little bit more later. But um, Accurate Descriptions is comprised of 17 drawings. Some of them are large and some of them are small, but they're formatted so that they could be all installed as a stripe a across a long wall, like a large scale comic strip. Um, and my goal was to experiment with a mode of storytelling, which forces together seemingly unrelated vignettes. Um, the only obvious similarity among the 17 drawings is the material application. They're all made with those layers and layers of colored pencil and small amounts of gouache on paper. Um, and so because the story is vague at best, uh, viewers, if they care to, um, will apply their own meaning and narrative. I was initially inspired to take on this project by a novel I read by Don DeLillo called White Noise. It's about the psychological aftermath of a toxic spill from a chemical plant in a suburban town. So the story follows a suburban family that's seemingly unconcerned with the toxic spill, even though the local government has directed everyone to evacuate. Um, and so I kind of feel like this is like now timely again in a way, but each member of the family is debilitated by some internal and personal torpor that's like unrelated to the toxic spill and distracts them from taking the few steps required to just get out of town. So I guess I had the problem of existential angst in, on my mind and um, also because of the apocalyptic event in the novel, I was thinking about stories of apocalypses just in general and how we view these stories and use these stories to examine life and death and our human relationship to the universe. So I did some research on the word apocalypse and learned that it comes from a Greek term meaning an unveiling of knowledge, which I thought was really interesting because the, the phrase unveiling of knowledge sounds so passive, um, especially compared to what we normally associate with apocalypses, which is like violent death and destruction. So I wanted to make a story about a different kind of apocalypse, one that occurs internally or maybe um, one that's experienced from inside a sealed room. <laughs> So what follows in my presentation is a visual list of 95 images. I feel like I should apologize for that beforehand. Um, I'm going to be like um, firing them at you, I think. But they document my work, uh, my process, and the work of my artistic influences. When I was invited to give this talk, I knew that I would dedicate a large portion of it talking about my influences. Um, for one thing, I think it makes an artist's work more interesting when you understand what motivates and inspires it. But mostly, I thought it would be more interesting for you to hear me talk about people other than myself. Uh, but with the goal of presenting my influences, I was faced with a problem. Who are, what are my influences? With the barrage of images and ideas that I've encountered over my lifetime, how do I know which ones have made the biggest impact? Um, so maybe it's the artwork that looks most like mine, but it seems to be that the work that most visually resembles mine in its manipulation of the formal elements like line, shape, color, texture, value, space, are often not the works that resonate most deeply with me. So I decided to credit the works that I think about the most, the ones that I can't shake for their profundity of expression. And I have to say that putting together this list was a significant challenge for me and an invaluable exercise. And it led me to draw some new connections for myself. So again, I appreciate the opportunity.
So like many artists, I'm really fascinated with um, Maya and Aztec codices. Um, and this is a facsimile edition of the Codex Borgia, which is an, uh, an Aztec manuscript. It's believed to have been produced in the 1400s before the Spanish conquest of Mexico. And it's made of animal skins that have been folded accordion style. And um, if you were to stretch it out, it would uh, measure about 35 feet in length. Um, scholars have translated many of the, the glyphs contained, but much of it's still a mystery. But it does contain the Aztec 260 day calendar and uh, the calendar catalogs um, information associated with um, cosmology and Aztec ritual and um, divination. Here's a, a page from the book. And another. And I think some of the appeal of these codices is that they 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 have some of the same appeal that like a comic strip does. I mean, um, this this particular codex has a right to left reading and we read left to right, but still there's like a linear progression of narrative here. And um, and because these are illegible to us, um, we can only imagine what the story is that it unfolds. So this is um, a, an installation photograph of my um, accurate description series containing the 17 drawings that were all made at different sizes, but, um, but formatted so that they all fit together in a stripe. So this is what they all look like together on exhibition. And, um, you know, I, 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 again, I forced this formatting because I wanted the viewer to associate the images with each other. And I wanted to try to force a narrative that way. So the, the images are, are pretty unrelated, like I said, in, in ways other than like the material application, but I was hoping to force some sort of story by installing them this way. And here's a view from the other side. One of the works um, in this series I titled Glyphs, and this is it. This is also a colored pencil drawing. Um, and I was kind of referencing the, the, the writing paper that you get when you're in grade school, when you're learning to create your letter forms. But um, this is, I consider this to be a prophetic piece, right? This is like my, my prophecy in, in, my, in my codex. I, um, I made this piece to predict the installation of the entire series. So I'll go back to the installation, you can see. And here's my, my prediction of what it would look like. So these are pro prophetic glyphs. And here they are all together. So you can see that um, what I predicted actually came true and it ended up being a piece in the, in the exhibition. Um, there's another artist that I, I really like who's also really inspired by these codices. His name is uh, Luigi Serafini and um, he published his first edition of this codex I'm not sure if I can pronounce it, but it's his last name, Sarah Finianus, I guess, um, in 1981. And this photograph is of a newer edition, but in it, he um, catalogs fictional flora and fauna and even invented an entire language with which to describe these items. So again, it's like illegible and all the letter forms that he created are, are very unique, as you can see. Here's another page from it, some invented flora. And um, a lot of the images are narrative in nature and um, allegorical too. And it kind of, um, once, you've, once you've viewed them one after the other, they kind of begin to form like some origin story for this species or this planet. And the book itself is like a fetish object. I mean, not only does it have this like dense, rich, invented text and all these images, but um, the book itself is just like this really beautiful object um, printed on this thick, 
textured paper. So the object itself is really, is really beautiful. Um, I grew up in Tarpon Springs, like Christine said, in a little house on Lake Tarpon, um, playing in and exploring our lush tropical flora here in Florida and avoiding alligators. And I've always thought it's so interesting that as Floridians, we kind of coexist with these uh, prehistoric beasts. And so um, I've always been interested in illustrations, um, like children's book illustrations of dinosaurs and other prehistoric beasts, but what kid isn't? So this is um, an example of the type of illustration that really appeals to me. This is from um, the golden classic, uh, the giant golden book of dinosaurs and other prehistoric reptiles. I also like the didactic nature of these types of books too, that um, not only do you get these beautiful illustrations, but um, you get to learn a little something. And then I love it when there's graphs included too. So you can compare the size of one animal to the size of another, or um, sometimes they'll make a little graph of a human. That, so, you can, so, so you can kind of see how big you would be compared to this beast. Um, but about growing up in Tarpon Springs, you know, I, I, I think Tarpon is just a, this really charming place to have grown up. It's, it's so beautiful and it's culturally novel. And, um, and I think that people usually romanticize their hometown, but I think I'm right about mine. I think it's a really um, interesting place to have grown up. So here's another example of the type of illustration that I just love. And here we have a little graphic of a human so you can see how big the human would be compared to the dinosaur. I, I moved to Texas for 12 years. Um, and during that time, I earned my MFA in painting from Texas Christian University. And while I had really great experiences in Texas, um, I always dreamed of my hometown of Tarpon and the surrounding area. And um, that's why I decided to move back to the area in 2016. So I now live in Clearwater and um, I'm really lucky to be um, an adjunct faculty member of the St. Petersburg College uh, Clearwater Campus Art Department. I think the art department is really outstanding. So I'm, I'm so glad to be able to contribute to it. Here is um, a drawing from my series, Accurate Descriptions, um, in which I, I think pretty obviously reference those types of children's book illustrations. So um, here I am with, uh, it, this is a self-portrait of me next to an invented whale. And um, this isn't a particular species of whale, it's, it's wholly invented. I did use um, some reference materials and looked at some different species of whales, but um, I was thinking of the whale as a symbol for um, that, that thing that is, that, that drives us, that's um, so hard to obtain, that we spend our life toiling to obtain, you know, kind of like how the whale is used as a metaphor in Moby Dick. So um, I was thinking about the use of that metaphor. It's um, also in the story of Jonah and the whale. And, and I started to wonder like, what would my whale look like? What does my whale look like? And I decided that my, my whale would be a total doofus. Um, so I invented this whale that has um, uh, thumb sucker teeth. And for, for reference, I actually uh, looked up photographs on the internet of poor little children that were thumb suckers and had the teeth that kind of stick out from having their thumb in their mouths all the time. So I gave my whale thumb sucker teeth and um, he's kind of got some testicles for a chin and um, he's a, a mouth breather, you know, he's got his bottom lip hanging down and then he's got a boob for a blowhole. Um, <laughs> and, and so, and, and then I posed myself kind of like in this Christ-like position with palms forward. Um, and then, you know, used a graphic to show my actual size compared to the whale and then um, the, the self-portrait on the left is a is a blow up of my actual size. So I was thinking of, um, I don't even know if it makes sense, but I, I imagine that this whale birthed me and um, and it will succeed me as well. So it like preceded me and it will succeed me. And, um, and here I am being compared to it. And here's that detail, you can see the little figure. 
Um, another influence of mine is Grant Wood. Um, this is his painting titled Parson Weems Fable from 1939. And, uh, I was lucky enough to see this painting in person several times. It's in the collection of the Eamon Carter uh, Jr. Museum in Fort Worth, which collects American and Western art. And um, this is just one of my favorite pieces ever. It's obvi obviously um, allegorical, um, telling the story about um, George Washington cutting, chopping down the, the cherry tree. And, um, I, I I just like um, I just I, I like the formal elements of this painting. Um, I like the crisp the crispness of the imagery, and um, I love the like illustrative qualities, the the narrative that's suggested, um, the framing devices. Just all of this is is really appealing to me. And and like I said, I love allegory. I just love stories. So something like this is right up my alley. Um, another drawing from my series, my series Accurate Descriptions, is this, which I called Chance Encounter One. So, um, you know, I love stories and I love origin stories and stories that explain um, where we come from and where we're going and um, what our connection is to the universe. So, um, I made this drawing and the following drawing to. Um, to 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 like narrate uh, a situation in which um, two people meet each other or might meet each other. So this is like a fictitious scenario. And um, instead of creating like some kind of fantastic or magical scenario, I thought, well, what would be like the most boring, most mundane way you could possibly meet um, your significant other? And I and I. Um, just imagine that a man and a woman would um, be climbing either side of a ladder at the same time and then, then they would just happen to meet at the top and lock eyes. And so this is a trompe l'oeil drawing. Um, this is all done in colored pencil, sharpie marker, and um, graphite pencil. So I, I drew the, the graph, what looks like graph paper, and then drew the pieces of tape that appear to be on the corners. And here's another scenario in which um, a man and a woman open doors on either side of a cabinet and um, they find the other standing on the other side and they lock eyes. Uh, another artist that I, I really like is Fred Tomaselli. He's a contemporary artist. This is a piece of his from 2002 called Breathing Head. And um, the Photographic images of Thomas Ellie's work never do it justice because you have to see them in person to really get an idea of um, how how they were made. And they're also usually really large scale too, which makes a difference. But um, I was lucky enough to hear Fred Thomas Ellie speak one time at the Fort Worth Modern Art Museum. And he's really funny and he's very insightful and he's got a really interesting perspective. But um, this, this piece was made with lots of different materials, leaves, photo collage, acrylic, wash, resin. Here's a detail just so you can see. So he and I think his studio assistants cut out just like thousands and thousands of little images from magazines and other printed material um, of flowers, birds, whatever's gonna be you know, used in a piece and then and then Fred Tomaselli um, collages them onto a surface, but in, in layers. So he'll lay down one layer of cut paper and then cover it with resin. And then another layer of cut paper goes down and it's covered in resin and on and on. So the, the pieces have literal depth to them. And when you see them in person, you can, you can, see that there's a uh, depth of layers in there. Here's another of his pieces, Monsters of Paradise times two. This one's got pills included. That was like a favorite um, medium of his for a while. He used a lot of pills. But here's a detail so you can see it a little better. But yeah, all these like mouths and eyes and hands were all cut from photographs and other um, graphic imagery. 
Um, this is a piece from, from my series, Accurate Descriptions, which is also now in the faculty exhibition. Um, I called it Library BC. So I mentioned in the beginning that I wanted to make a story about an apocalypse, but like a really quiet kind of passive apocalypse. Um, just considering the, the meaning of apocalypse as being the unveiling of knowing. So in my story, I've got two libraries, both of which are included in the faculty exhibition. One um, is the library in um, the BC era, which is um, before the era of knowing. And then one library um, takes place in the AD era, which is the era after the unveiling of knowledge. So this is the library BC. And um, each of the books um, has been given a title with the initials BC. Uh, to, to make this piece, I actually went to the library with a shopping cart that I borrowed from a sculpture department. I don't, I don't know how they got a hold of a shopping cart, but I won't ask questions. So I borrowed the shopping cart and went down to the library. And I was allowed to check out 100 books at a time. And um, so I took that as a challenge and I filled the shopping cart with the maximum number of books that I could check out at a time. So I came back with 100 books. And then in my studio, I just set the books up, trying to make little like architectural structures with them. And then um, once I was satisfied with how they were set up, then, then I drew them. And, um, and then I had to give them all titles. So, um, you know, I knew I was gonna give them all BC titles, and now I had to come up with the names. And I can't tell you how much fun I had coming up with these titles. Um, I was doing a lot of commuting at the time, so I would keep my phone's voice recorder app on in the passenger seat next to me, and I'd be, you know, driving like 70 miles per hour down down the highway, and then picking up my phone and saying, "Boob creases" or "brown crevices" as I thought of them, and it was really fun. And I actually came up with a couple of hundred titles. And then I had to narrow it down to like the 80 best or something like that. So boob creases made it in, obviously. Um, but uh, um, the, the way that I applied the material to this piece was uh, so tedious, almost torturous, um, but I kind of like to work that way. I like uh, um, tedium. And because somehow it feels also furious, like it's so tedious that it's just, it feels furious. So here's a detail of that. Um, so again, this was created with layers and layers and layers of colored pencil. Um, but then I decided to, to like weather or age the, the book covers by scratching into the wax, the waxy layers with, um, with a sharp tool. So, where the books look worn on the edges that was actually the wax having been scraped away. And um, to do that, I, I bought some um, cheap, like disposable calligraphy pens that you fill with ink. And I just didn't fill it with ink, I just used the nib of the pen. And um, I went through several packs of pens because I kept snapping off the, the tips. But, um, but I was kind of satisfied with the result and I had never done a reductive thing like that with colored pencil. Um, the lettering really took a long time, and it's funny how when, when you're making an art piece, the smallest decision can really trip you up. I, I remember wondering if I should use a lettering with serifs, because that seems more literary, I guess, or to use a font with no serifs um, for legibility. And I decided that legibility was important, so I went with, <laughs> with a font that didn't have serifs, but I still wonder if that was the right decision. Here's another detail. Bulging crotches is one of my favorites. So when I was a kid, um, I was lucky enough to have a grandmother that took me to the library all the time, um, at least a couple times every week. And at that time, the, the Tarpon Springs Public Library was located just off of Craig Park and our beautiful bayou. And this is where my interest in art and in reading was birthed and then nurtured. And I developed an interest in books um, separate from the act of reading them. 
I appreciated books as physical objects with their own tactile qualities, um, their own graphic qualities, and even their own aromas. Um, so it's interesting to think about books as being these very literal physical objects that house very abstract concepts. And I suppose that books are like people in that way. So um, these books in my BC library, they are um, for the most part reference books. They catalog um, uh, based on themes that, such as boob creases or brown crevices. So they're, they're mostly catalogs. I would put them probably <clears throat> uh, categorize most of these books as nonfiction. But um, going back to the idea of the library, um, you know, the, the books themselves are these like physical, literal objects which house these abstract concepts. But the thing that houses the things that house the ideas, the library itself, is also a really amazing thing. It's responsible for documenting and cataloging all of this information, just everything under the sun and beyond. So if you're a library patron, you can learn and decode this cataloging system and then gain access to a universe of information, both mundane and fantastic. And then um, with effort and commitment, you can learn and decode some of that. So I think um, that's my association between like the codices and, um, and then just like our modern idea of the library. So this idea of the library with its responsible responsibility to document and catalog um, has had a really big influence on my work. Um, my work has been colored by my ache to document and catalog, both in a practical sense and in a conceptual sense. Um, I'm someone who keeps really detailed records of a lot of things. <laughs> I probably spend way too much time recording things. But I record um, everything from daily appointments to my exercise to the food that I eat. I record the books that I read. Um, I record interesting terms, phrases, and quotations that I come across. And it's like this impulse to accumulate and organize as much experience as I can, even if it's um, secondhand or even thirdhand. And it works on the assumption that at some point I'll have enough data to make sense of things. So I don't know if that'll ever actually happen. Um, so as I said, I went to the library a lot as a kid. It was kind of a free activity. So that was um, part of the appeal of it, I think, for my, for my grandmother. But she was also a big reader. Um, but, you know, I, this is and this is when I started reading novels too, and um, novels meant for young adults. And um, I think that the cover illustrations of these novels really had a big impact on me too. I I like how um, kind of gentle a lot of these illustrations are. They're kind of naturalistic, but still have a little bit of the awkwardness that's that's anticipated from from you know. Um, a, a painting or a drawing made by the human hand. But um, one of the things that I really liked about these paperback cover illustrations, um, they always feature a moment from, from the narrative that's out of context until so you read the story, but they often hint at some turning point in the life of the protagonist. And the stories are often about the protagonist's search for identity, um, whether through socially subversive behaviors or through their yearning for social acceptance. And so this one was an example of a, a book in which the protagonist was yearning for social acceptance, right? I also really, really liked the ones, especially as I got a little bit older, that kind of hinted at um, some salacious content too, like this one, The Summer of Mrs. McGregor. And I should probably be embarrassed to admit that I just recently read this one, like as an adult. And it wasn't as salacious as I had hoped, but I, I bet if I had read it as like a 
12 year old, it would have been more exciting. <laughs> Um, my absolute favorite paperback cover illustrations um, were made by a man named James Matthews. He painted all 250 covers for the Sweet Valley High series, which um, had which played like such a significant role in my, in my youth. I can't tell you, but um, this this was probably my favorite um, cover of the Sweet Valley High series because um, it features this mustachioed college guy. Um, and the title just all night long really hints at some exciting content. But an interesting thing that I didn't learn until you know I was long beyond these books was that James Matthews, the, the cover illustration artist, he's a Floridian. He was born in Tampa. Um, and he lived for many years in Tarpon Springs. <laughs> so um, that's probably not mind blowing information to many people, but I couldn't believe it when I learned this. Um, I was probably, I think I was 14 years old when, when I learned this information. And um, he actually lived walking distance from this house on Lake Tarpon that I grew up on. And I couldn't believe that this genius had lived so close to me for so long and I never met him. But he, he according to his website, he now lives in Tallahassee and um, you can um, commission him to paint your portrait starting at $200. So I have an idea of what I'm gonna buy myself for Christmas, but here's another cover, Leaving Home. So again, kind of like a search for identity theme going on here. Kidnapped by the cult always um, a big source of anxiety for teens. The Stolen Diary, having your um, innermost secrets revealed. And then just for contrast, I wanted to show this cover for Sweet Valley University, which is a series that um, succeeded Sweet Valley High. And this one obviously has a photographic cover, which doesn't nearly have the same impact as the painted covers. Maybe that's my opinion. Um, here's another image by Grant Wood to make a weird leap, but um, Grant Wood, again, one of my favorite artists. I, I love the mundanity of these images. Like somehow they are really mundane and, and like these figures are so static and just such regular looking rural folk, but um, maybe because of this, stylization this, this painting is really interesting and obviously lots of people think so because this is um, probably Grant Wood's most well-known image and um, I tried to create a self-portrait kind of along the same vein just kind of like a really mundane self-portrait um, in a really mundane environment so this is from my series accurate descriptions too Um, another another thing that I'm really interested in that that seems like um, unrelated to my previous influences is um, I, I just I, I love conceptual texts and this is a book of the early writings of Vito Acconci um, titled Language to Cover a Page. This is the cover of the book, but inside um, he's created a catalog of words, phrases. And um, I have to say, it's like the, one of the most boring things you could possibly look at, but I think um, they, they would be incredibly interesting to, to make. And just the idea that they were made in the first place is kind of interesting. So all of these works were created like between 1960 and 1970. So I've um, transcribed some of the text on the right hand side of the screen so you could read it a little better. I think this is a list of like verbal segues. In fact, therefore, on the other hand, in brief, um, 
so I, I mentioned that I have this like impulse to um, collect and record and document and organize. Um, I've been since 2016 maintaining um, a commonplace book. And um, this is something that I actually learned about in 2016. I don't know, just like one of those rabbit holes that you go down on the internet. But I learned that um, what's called the commonplace book has been a, a, a strategy for um, for learning that people have used for um, many years. So politicians, anybody who considers themselves a thinker, like politicians, writers, um, a lot of them have maintained these commonplace books. And so this is my commonplace book. Um, a commonplace book is a place where you um, collect uh, transcribed material, but it's not to be confused with a diary. So there should be nothing um, autobiographical or personal in the book at all, but um, it should be a place where you collect um, quotes, bits of wisdom, you can transcribe information that you get from other sources. So this is the commonplace book that I've been maintaining and it's um, um, here's one of the page my commonplace book which is where i transcribed what i learned about the com about the commonplace book and i um I, I typed over here on the right hand side you can see a little bit larger what's written there but um one of the strategies for using the commonplace book is that um once you start to collect some some transcribed information and then you can start to divide it up into themes such as science and philosophy and art. So I've got mine divided up into a few themes. I've got um, philosophy, science, process. And um, by process, I mean like any anytime someone mentions um, their artistic or creative process, has something interesting to say about that, I'll, I'll, um, I'll collect it. And then I have some DIY recipes too. Recipes for making my own shampoo, stuff like that. Here's another page from my commonplace book in which I transcribed um, Mark Twain's Puddinhead Wilson's new calendar quotes from Following the Equator, one of his travelogues. And um, this is a transcription of um, some information I received from a, a hypnosis course that I took once. Um, and then here's another weird leap, but um, another artist that has been really influential on me is Jim Shaw. Jim Shaw is a contemporary artist who lives in California. And I first learned of Jim Shaw because he was getting some attention for his thrift store paintings. So he, the story goes that he collected um, for years paintings that he found in thrift stores or maybe even at garage sales too and then um, documented them, photographed them, and then um, published them all in a book together. And so they were, um, the, the book was sold, it's called Thrift Store Paintings, and um, it got Jim Shaw a lot of attention. And, um, you know, at the time I thought, oh, that's, that's a neat project, that sounds like it'd be kind of fun, um, but didn't really think too much about it. And then I came across Jim Shaw again, and um, something clicked, and I felt like I really started to understand Jim Shaw as an artist. So then I revisited these thrift store paintings, and I started to become suspicious that these weren't found paintings at all. Like, I started to think that he made them all. Um, for one thing, I, I felt like I could recognize his hand um, Jim Shaw is like a really talented draftsman and painter and um, you know he can he can paint with really sophisticated application but um, but he is totally not above using like the vernacular of the amateur right so um, I, I could totally see him making all of these paintings or maybe having some studio assistants make the paintings as well and then um, and then collecting them and, and, and making up this story about them having been found at a thrift store. And so I kind of ran that by some other people and they thought, no, like 
you know, well, one, one of my arguments was, well, how did he get so many paintings? I mean, there's like hundreds of paintings collected in this book. How did he get so many paintings? Like I never run across paintings like this at a thrift store, but it was pointed out to me that he, he lives in California and there's like a ton of art schools in California. So if you dumpster dive in California, you could probably come up with some paintings. But, um, but I was still really suspicious. And I don't know if it's just because I really want to believe that he made all these paintings. But then I, I read something um, um, an art critic had written about Jim Shaw. And um, he also suspected that Jim Shaw, after interviewing Jim Shaw, he, he also suspected that Jim Shaw had made these paintings too, or had them made for the project. So either way, I mean, if these were genuinely collected from thrift stores, I find that an interesting project. But um, I just really like the idea of him creating this fictitious collection. Here's another one, kind of a homage to surrealism. Um, another thing that I, I'm really, I think influenced by, or I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm not influenced by it because I only came across these over the past couple of years, but something that really um, interests me are the back pages of Harper's magazines where they list their findings for the month. And the findings page is, is always in the very last page in the magazine. And it's kind of a dispassionate listing of um, all kinds of scientific discoveries um, from really small and mundane to like really amazing, just listed one after the other with no relationship to each other. It's um, as you can see here, like usually broken up into a couple of paragraphs, but the way that the paragraphs are broken up, it, it seems kind of like arbitrary. Um, and so here's like an example of what um, a paragraph in Harper's Magazine might read like these. Neuropsychologists develop a shorter IQ test for children with shorter attention spans. The depression prone or less attracted to the political right. The nocturnal heart rate of young men can be predicted by their female partner's daytime feelings of intimacy or annoyance. Men who pose for photos with cats are seen as less dateable. So like I said, it's like this dispassionate list of these unrelated statements. Um, and I find that really interesting. I like um, reading them one after the other and, um, you know, just like forcing some kind of connection between one fact and another. Here's another page. Um, so I, I had mentioned, you know, that I, that I make all these lists and one of the lists that I've been keeping, um, I've titled enigmatic phrases, which is a really like, um, highbrow way of saying like, um, phrases that I don't understand. And, um, I started keeping this list of enigmatic phrases after, um, I noticed a book, um, on the office shelf of an art historian, the spine of the book read Monuments to the Lost Cause. And it's like I saw this, the, the spine of the book in my periphery. So it didn't seem like it was making a huge impact on me in the moment, but the phrase kept haunting me. And it's like, I kept seeing the phrase um, in front of my face as though like, um, you know, when you look at the sun and then you see a negative, it's like, um, I, I kept seeing the image of that spine in my head. And so I became really obsessed with this phrase, monuments to the lost cause. And um, so I decided to record it in my journal and start a list called um, enigmatic phrases. So, and these are just like mysterious phrases that I can't quite wrap my head around. But um, so I kept pondering this phrase, um, monuments to the lost cause and thinking like, what does that mean? Um, and I think I, I, you know, I should have just typed it into Google, I guess, um, cause I could have gotten an answer, but I think I was just reluctant to demystify it for myself. So, um, finally I decided to ask someone else. So I asked this other artist, I said, I saw this book titled monuments to the lost cause. What, 
what does that mean? What's that book about? And she said, um, well, it's probably a book of Civil War statues. And um, so I felt like a real dummy. I was like, well, yes, of course, the lost cause. Yes, that's how they refer to the Civil War. So I felt like a real dummy. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it just kind of um, elucidated my, my very human condition, you know. I desire knowledge, but I'm also kind of afraid of it too. So I want more understanding of the world, but, um, but I also kind of fear it. And I think that's just kind of a human condition, right? So one of the phrases on my um, list of enigmatic phrases was regard the squalor. And this is a phrase that I came across in that Don DeLillo book, White Noise. Um, there's a, a, a part of the story where the, um, the, the husband character is, suspects the wife character of having an affair. And um, he goes to a hotel he goes to a hotel and finds um, his wife and another man in the room, in the room together. And he shoots the other man and it's, you know, kind of violent and there's blood everywhere. And um, the narrator, the protagonist, the husband character um, uh, instructs himself to regard the squalor, which I thought was um, such a funny thing to say because it's, um, to regard something seems kind of passive, right? And um, so this violent act had just taken place and he's just gonna regard the squalor of it. So um, I don't know, I just wanted to take that enig enigmatic phrase and create like a little Dada poem or something out of it. So um, I created this trompe l'oeil drawing. It's, this is again, colored pencil. So it's um, a draw, um, what looks like an index card has been drawn with colored pencil and marker and then the tape has been drawn. And um, I started with the phrase, regard the squalor, and then um, came up with a bunch of my own phrases that were R the S. And so I kind of used the same system, you know, like my, my voice recorder app. Um, but as I was collecting these phrases of mine, um, they started to sound kind of like a to-do list. Um, so after coming up with many phrases and then kind of editing and revising and rearranging them, um, I, I felt that it served as a good kind of existential to-do list. So, um, and, and this is kind of um, a to-do list for an artist too, right? You first regard the squalor, then you have to relish the subtle, record the schema and research the standards, rehearse the sequence and ready the sphincter, Render the semblance and resist the sacred, reflect the sublime, rebuke the specious, relay the symptoms, reveal the subtext, resolve the scruples, refine the syntax, redeem the scabrous, repair the schism, and then repeat the series. Um, then I thought if I made an R the S list, I should make a S the R list. So um, I tried to come up with an S the R phrase that was similar to my regard the squalor phrase. And so I, this one starts with survey the ruin. And this one's also like a to-do list for an artist too, right? You survey the ruin, then you swallow the regret, you suppress the reflex, supply the resolve, suppose the routine, sustain the rigor, supplant the record, scatter the refuse, submit the report, study the response, surmount the rancor, stomach the rueful, surmise the reasons, suture the ruptures, secure the restraint, sanction the regime, and then signal the rapture. This is another um, kind of like word, word drawing I did, um, starting with the title of a book that I thought was really great, which was Perverse Desire and the Ambiguous Icon. It was a book about art theory. And um, I tried to read the book, but it was like a little above me, so. <laughs> I might have read the introduction, but I'm still really interested in this title. And um, maybe it's better that I don't read it right now. I can just imagine what it's about. So I started with the phrase perverse desire and the ambiguous icon. And then I just kind of played a game with myself where I used the thesaurus to um, uh, look up each of those words and find a synonym for the original words. And then I just kept um, looking up the previous word and finding a synonym for it and then uh, another synonym until, you know, perverse um, became exuberant, desire became sublimity, um, ambiguous became metaphysical and icon somehow became void. 
I had fun doing that. And then here's another one um, where I used antonyms. Um, I, I especially liked the, um, the fictitious book title, Chaste Visualization and the Discriminating Accomplishment. I feel like that might be a book on masturbation. Here's my AD library. Um, so this is the library of books after um, the apocalypse, which is the unveiling of knowing. So all of these books have AD titles and um, use the same system, just uh, my voice recorder app and just coming up with every AD title that I could. The AD book library is um, comprised of reference books like Amarillo Deputies, um, but also uh, philosophy books like Also Desirous. It's got a lot of reference books in it too, like Abysmal Dumps. And um, uh, self-help books like Announcing Descent. And here's a, a detail. How's that for a transition? Um, another type of image that I really enjoy, that I really like, and that I think has had an influence on my work are, are um, photographs and illustrations of consumer goods. And so the, the following slides I'm going to show you are, um, are from the Harriet Carter mail order catalog. And I think what I like so much about these images, especially when taken out of context, um, they lend these really mundane objects just this like magical profundity. I mean, look at this double extension cord. What is it? What is it saying? What does it mean? This is one of my favorites, the fly blaster. Um, the Harriet Carter mail order catalog has been around since 1958 and they they boast that the gifts they carry help recipients stay organized, prioritize their home and health, and have fun. That's the goal of the products in the Harriet Carter magazine. Um, and like many people, I grew up looking at um, catalogs of consumer goods like clothing and small appliances. And like I said, taken out of context, these images are just so strange and enigmatic. They, and they kind of look like Dada experiments too. I also, I really like the ones that um, kind of demonstrate how the product is to be used. So there's some sort of like human interaction in there, like demonstrating how it can be used or how it should be used. And so here's a drawing from my series, Accurate Descriptions, in which I was really thinking about these photographs of consumer goods. This one's called Drips. And um, so I've got these features, this really mundane, boring subject matter, these washcloths on a, on a towel rack. Um, but I was hoping um, that with the gendered colors um, and, and, and other, you know, um, other things about the drawing that I could maybe suggest at some salacious content. Like I was thinking about these um, two washcloths as um, being sexy. Like they're, they're kind of like sexy washcloths. Um, the, the, the blue washcloth is, is stiff and the pink washcloth is wet. They're next to each other, not touching, but almost. And here's a detail of that. And here's another of uh, my mundane consumer goods. This is just kind of like one of those um, banners that you can buy for your grade school classroom to decorate your, your bulletin board. Um, but I just wanted to feature something like this out of context, you know, something so cheap and boring. Um, I would say to elevate it, but not even to really to elevate it, just to look at it, just to look at it out of context. I wanted to see it. 
Um, I've got a, a couple images by Stuart Davis. He's just one of my absolute uh, favorite artists. So for all my talk of loving mundanity, you know, and like these really um, boring images, I, I also really love really abstracted, stylized images too. Um, Stuart Davis um, was an artist associated with uh, a, a group of artists that are referred to as the American Vanguard. And um, the Eamon Carter Museum that I mentioned in Fort Worth, Texas, that collects the American and, and Western art, they have um, lots of Stuart Davis works. So I had the pleasure of, of seeing them many times. But um, I think Stuart Davis's um, sense of color is just really sophisticated in composition and they're just so stylish. And another artist that's also associated with the American Vanguard is Jan Matulka, who's a Czech American painter. And um, he also really just stylizes this um, more mundane subject matter. And I think that I kind of uh, got my ideas about color from these artists. So here's a piece from, from my series, Accurate Descriptions. I called it impending birth. It was supposed to be a kind of a play on words, but I, I don't even know if it makes sense, but that's okay. So um, obviously a Christmas tree. Um, I wanted to make this drawing because I, uh, for, for one thing, I just thought it would be really obnoxious to draw a Christmas tree. And it was also, uh, I completed this drawing kind of near Christmas too. So it like made it extra horrible, but um, I wanted to take this kind of everyday object that maybe also had some, um, religious connotations uh, with it and just make it kind of really fantastic and otherworldly and um, science fiction like I guess. So going back to Jim Shaw, that, that artist that um, collected the thrift store paintings, um, this, this is the book of his that really helped me to understand his work. It's called um, My Mirage. And um, it's, it's this really interesting catalog of all these works that Jim Shaw has made over a couple of decades. Um, and he, um, he has this, um, it, it's the, the works all together kind of tell um, a, a story, like a story starts to evolve. He's got a protagonist um, named Billy. And um, Billy, I think, is somewhat autobiographical. You know, he's like a suburban kid um, growing up and going to public school, just like everyone else. And um, it kind of like uh, got some existential questions and um, having some experiences like normal teenage experiences like drugs and sex. And um, so this is from My Mirage. And this is, um, you know, it, it, references like a yearbook page. And these are um, Billy's fictitious female classmates. Um, but underneath the image of each of the girls, instead of listing their names, he's listed them by religion. So their religions are, I, I transcribed them over on the right of the screen. And then this is another piece from, from his, his My Mirage book. Um, it's a utopian landscape. Here's another one of those yearbook pages. Um, this time he categorizes the girls in his class um, by their vice or their drug of choice. Um, and this is, this is an image from his My Mirage series in which he references the um, American illustrator Norman Rockwell. Um, and he's even signed it, Nelson Rockwell. I, I, got, I researched this image to see if he was referencing a specific Norman Rockwell painting, and I, I didn't see anything similar to it. But it is a painting of boys getting up to some mischief. These boys are looking at nudie magazines, which would never have happened in a Norman Rockwell painting. But, um, but it's still about boys getting up to mischief. And um, so Jim Shaw is this really interesting artist that references um, you know, historical art, and contemporary art and um, all different styles of art. He also works in a variety of media too. 
So here he is referencing Norman Rockwell. So I included a, a, an image by Norman Rockwell. Again, he was an American illustrator who's really well known for um, painting many of the cover illustrations for Saturday Evening Post. And this is one of his probably most famous covers, um, No Swimming. So here they are, boys, some boys getting up to some mischief, right? But this mischief is very wholesome. These boys were just swimming in a swimming hole that they weren't supposed to be swimming in. And Norman Rockwell um, is a really interesting artist to me. You know, I think he gets, he gets really criticized in academic circles because people say that he pandered to middle-class values. Um, should I take offense? I don't know. But anyway, so that he panders right to these middle class values. Um, but I think Norman Rockwell was actually really self aware and he had a good sense of humor. Um, this is another one of his Saturday Evening Post covers. Um, it's called The Connoisseur. And um, the story goes that Norman Rockwell, who was a contemporary of Jackson Pollock's, um, actually, you know, um, created this splatter painting by mimicking. Um, Jackson Pollock's process. So he laid this unstretched canvas out on the floor of his studio and then went into like a little meditative dance around it, dripping paint, and then um, and then painted that painting for this cover. And I think it's a really, um, you know, I think he's kind of um, making fun of Jackson Pollock a little bit, which just shows his good sense of humor. And um, another thing that leads me to believe that Norman Rockwell is very self-aware um, is that he was once quoted as saying, if a painting's not working, put a dog in it. And if the painting's still not working, put a bandage on the dog. And here's my um, kind of uh, reference to um, important art history. Um, this was a drawing that was in the, the previous faculty exhibition. I titled it For Dick. So there's a um, a uh, really well-known abstract expressionist named Richard Diebenkorn that I love. Um, lots of people love him. And um, I have a, a, a friend named um, Richard Smith who lives um, down in Texas. And when he was in graduate school, he was also a very big fan of Richard Diebenkorn. And uh, so he um, wanted to make some paintings that were very Richard Diebenkorn-like. And he made this one painting that's so amazing. I think um, I could probably pass it off as a Richard Diebenkorn painting. It, it looks so much like the like the real thing and I'm lucky to be in possession of that painting. And I thought since it was kind of a copy um, of a painting that it would be fun for me to make a copy of a copy of a painting. So this is my colored pencil rendering of the Richard Smith painting that was painted after the Richard Diebenkorn painting. And so I use colored pencil and like a super laborious process to um, to mimic the paint strokes. And this is actually like a trompe l'oeil frame that I that I drew. And um, the the wall behind the painting is um, also drawn, and the the double cast shadow is also drawn. So this is just like a trompe l'oeil drawing of a painting. Here's another by Jim Shaw. And so these Jim Shaw images in my mirage are just like these catalogs um, of objects and images on different themes. Here's another um, yearbook page featuring Billy's uh, female classmates. This time um, they have um, been rendered as still life objects and labeled with their names. Here's another one in which the girls in Billy's class um, have been categorized as either saved or lost. I think Jim Shaw is such an interesting artist because if you were to take any of these pieces individually, to, to look at them individually, you'd be like, okay, that's cute or nice or cool. But it's not until you look at um, a ton of his works. Um, that that you really start to un understand it. So I think it's kind of demanding of the viewer in that way. You can't just look at a single piece and um, get a full appreciation for it. You have to look at his entire body of work to, to understand and start to see these themes develop and make these connections that are really interesting. Um, this is one of my favorite um, um, centerfolds in the book, Billy's self-portrait. 
The image on the left is the underpainting for the image on the right. And that's just my type of sense of humor. One more Jim Shaw image. And then this is my final image. This is my uh, last piece in the exhibition um, called Single Digit. This is how I finished this, these, the story of accurate descriptions. Um, it makes reference to religious iconography with kind of the, um, the purple veil, maybe like um, suggesting the figure of the Madonna seen in art history. And, um, you know, I, I finished the story with this um, as I wanted this single digit to kind of represent the, the self, the singular, the solitary, um, the fully realized self, right? The ultimate ideal figure. And that's it. Jennifer, thank you so much. Um, we've got a, a, a couple of folks who have sent in some questions in the chat, if you have some time to answer them. Sure. One of our questions is, um, it seems like your work really reflects a desire to learn, but also hold on to knowledge. Um, is this, do you think, sort of displayed in the images that you've selected for the exhibition and, and your theory of the sort of quiet apocalypse? Um, yeah, I guess the, um, the question was about like my desire for knowledge and to acquire information, right? Um, I, I actually was, was thinking about this earlier and I, I kind of forgot to say it um, when I was talking, but um, th there's kind of this fear of actually obtaining the information that you desire. Um, you know, there's always the question, is it better to know or to not know? And does a state of knowing actually exist? Um, for facts and information to culminate in truth, um, we have to regard them in the proverbial larger context, but um, what does that mean if our context is larger than we suppose or even infinite? <laughs> so kind of like there's this desire to accumulate um, and categorize and catalog information, but also a fear of it too, because what does that mean once you've done all that? Um, does it culminate in anything? Does it help you to understand the world any better? Um, does it make you happier? I'm not sure if I answered the question though. Um, did I answer the question? I don't know. I think so. Um, we have another, another question um, in, in probably one of my favorite things that you touched on perhaps with the Sweet Valley book covers. Um, but uh, this question is, um, the Sweet Valley book covers sort of show the stories reduced down to a single plot point, like a tableau. Um, do you view your works uh, in the same way? Yeah, I think, you know, I think so. And I'll have to write that down because I don't know if I had considered that before, but, um, but like I said, um, being kind of forced in the situation to come up with a list of my influences has really helped me to draw some new connections. And I knew that those book covers had had a big influence on me, but that's an interesting connection that I hadn't really thought of, but just these like um, single moments serving as tableaus, like um, taken out of context of a larger story. I would say, yeah, for sure. Personally, I think, um if we're gonna if we're gonna start going down that rabbit hole right because it's always sort of a never-ending um path of discovery um I, I might even say that that's really similar to another one of the things that you mentioned that influences you which is those codices right where each of the glyphs are meant to be um sort of read and understood in and of themselves um so it's really similar um to that sort of tableau format yeah, that's really, that's really interesting too. Well, Jennifer, um, you have given us so much to think about. It's been really fantastic to see sort of your thought processes um, and sort of influence behind the works that you create. 
Um, Christina, do you have any, do you have any questions on your end that have come through, Christine? Um, you know, I just had one that actually seems so basic compared to all we've explored this evening. <laughs> but I find, uh, from the perspective of an artist, what in particular um, drew you to using the medium of colored pencil uh, and gouache? I, you know, I find colored pencil to be such a, um, people are afraid to use it because it's, it is a slow method of, of drawing. And how did you get into that? It's funny that you say that, Christine, because I'm always thinking like, wh why am I using this material? Like it's such a slow process and I could probably make images that are totally comparable and like maybe even indiscernible from these with a much faster method. So um, I might cons consider doing that in the future, but I do really like the, t the tedium, you know, it's kind of, um, it's kind of meditative, but it's so, it's so tedious that I feel like I'm working furiously. So I feel like I'm working so hard and I'll have covered like an area that big. <laughs> um, it's kind of, uh, there's like a futility to it. Maybe I'm uh, masochistic. But um, I guess I like colored pencil because of like the the gentle illustrative qualities that it's capable of, kind of like the um, the paper the some of the gentler paperback cover illustrations that I like. And um, and I just I really like drawing. I'm um, you know my my MFA is in painting, which always surprises people when I say I don't really paint. Um, but the the graduate school I went to just separated students, categorized students by um, 2D and, and 3D. So if you were a 2D graduate student, you went into painting. But I really like the immediacy of drawing, that you have this tool that can make this immediate mark on a piece of paper. And, um, um, and I guess I enjoy that a drawing is just like this accumulation of, of lines. It's just like this dense buildup, like this network of lines. I don't know if that answered your question, Christine. No, it does. And, and, and again, you know, we talked before, someday um, I'd love to see you explore some printmaking. I mean, sometimes your, your work really, instead of drawing, almost looks like a color etching or a lithograph or something, which um, is laborious times 10, if you're ever interested <laughs> in <laughs> printmaking. But, um, but it, it's, it's really beautiful. And I just, even though I feel like I know so many artists, um, I, I don't know too many that are working with colored pencil. It's very um, unusual, and, um, but, but the results are absolutely stunning. So well, thank, thank you. you so much. <laughs> but uh, that was, the, that was, was all I had. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, no, thank, thank you so much, Christine, um, and thank you, Jennifer. Um, you know, we're getting a lot of messages in the chat thanking, thanking you for the presentation. Um, Sharon mentioned, you know, as someone who loves books, uh, you seem to have this theme throughout your art and explorations. Um, and we really just couldn't be happier to have you with us tonight to, to share this experience with us. Um, the, the humor and the light that your works bring are, are much enjoyed. And um, as we were talking just before the, the meeting began, um, something that's, that's bringing a lot of joy to a lot of people as they come and view the exhibition. So thank you so much for this uh, presentation tonight. Um, and we're, we're going to hopefully get this up online tomorrow. So for those of you um, who, who would want to share this with your loved ones and friends and family, um, we'll have this online tomorrow. So thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, everyone else. And um, we wish you a, a healthy, happy, good evening. Thank, thank you so you much.